Hi everyone and welcome to the Dawn Jarvis show. This is the podcast where we talk to busy leaders and professionals and business owners about who they are, what they do and why they do it. We also talk about how they manage to stay focused, positive and productive and to maintain their own health and well-being. Today's guest is Tom Schiff, Dr Tom Schiff and we are going to be talking about how white men can be allies for social justice. We are going to learn why white men have a critical role to play in working for social justice and how white men have so much to gain by working in that critical role for social justice. I met Tom in, um, we were both guests on a diversity and inclusion panel in the States for an organization and we stayed in touch and he's a fascinating guy to talk to. Dr. Tom Schiff has over 35 years experience as a consultant educator with organizations ranging from small local nonprofits to Fortune 500 companies. He has a particular expertise working with men and boys on issues of health, leadership, violence, race and racism, sexual harassment, sexism and homophobia. Hi Tom, it's so good to see you and I'm so glad you're here. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Am I, Dawn? Nice to see you as well. So the first thing I want to ask you is how did you get to be working um, in social justice, in racism, around diversity and inclusion? And um, I, it seems odd to say, but I'm going to say it, as a white man, how did you get to be where you are today? It's okay to say it that way. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think I, I actually believe that part of how I got here has to do with my heritage uh, and my life. I mean, my, my mom, I grew up with a feminist mom. And so I was hearing about gender uh, all my life and thinking about it and dealing with it, whether I wanted to or not. Um, you know, it's, I think when you're somebody who's in a um, privileged position, it can often be very challenging to have to look at that. And I've had to do that since pretty young. So I think, and then another part of that is I come from a family of Holocaust survivors. My father was actually born in, in Germany, um, in Berlin, and they left uh, in Germany in 1936 when he was seven. They were fortunate enough mostly to get out. Some of the yeah. family did not. Um, and, and so then part of, uh, and then some of the family ended up in South America. Uh, they ended up, my dad's family ended up in New York. Um, in 1938, when other family members tried to leave, the borders were closed because mm. God forbid that we would actually try to take care of immigrants that were in need. Um, we're going to get political, apparently. So, and, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, um, uh, but all, and then a bunch of them ended up back in the States. And, you know, all my life I heard things about, you know, never again. Yeah. you know, that it's really important for us to speak up and speak out and not just for our people, but for all people, yeah. right? And so I think that's a piece of it as well. Yeah. When I started working, when I went to, um, when I graduated from uh, college, my uh, degree was in education and I didn't, and social studies history, I didn't really go that direction, but I ended up working with kids who had been abused and taken out of their homes. And began to see really who was being regulated. Yeah. In other words, you know, how class and race fit into who were, who was in the system and who wasn't in the system. Yeah. At a certain point, I started working with, in an organization that worked with men who had been abusive. That was one of the things that we did. And the same sort of thing, you know, if you were white and middle class, uh, you could go into a program, have counseling, so forth. Um, if you were a man of color, you're more likely to end up going to jail. So just continuing to see those disparities, I think. Yeah, you said a few things there, and, you know, we've talked before. And, you know, so I guess the first thing I want to draw out is your, your Jewish heritage, the impact of the Holocaust, having to, um, coming from... Um, being a child of an immigrant, I guess, and as as I am in the in the in the UK, and how that impacts on um, how you, the way you see you see the world. 
and also um I guess working with men isn't it around um you know I'm a woman as you know and um and it's a different it's a different perspective I guess working with men as a as as a man but you noticing who as you said who who was regulated what the impacts of abuse and the way we treat people who are abused and have been abused I guess and that that must bring a lot to your work as well and you know yeah I, yeah it's it's and you know I'm, I'm a nurse I, I work with people who um when I was nursing clinically who were, were unwell and knew that where they came from and definitely from my own heritage which is from the Caribbean you know how that impacted on health and 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 wellness but um I suppose it's if you go from a social justice point of view knowing where people come from is really important would you say Tom? I would say so. I think it's important to understand your own heritage. It's an under, important to understand other, where other people come from, to understand that um, folks have a different experience of the world than you do, than we each do, right? And so as a, as a white man living in the world that I live in, knowing that um, white women, uh, all BIPOC folks, uh, folks, and I'm also cisgender and heterosexual. So, you know, folks who are transgender, folks who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, are having, maybe having a very different experience of what it's like to be in the world. You know, I have a relative sense of safety. Yeah. So, you know, you know uh, one of the ways I, I think about it is, so I live, I live in Western Massachusetts and I live in the woods. And we have this beautiful track of land behind our property, um, 25 square miles of town land with lots of trails back there. Okay. It's quite beautiful. Well, you know, next time you're in Western Massachusetts, come visit. We'll go for I a will. walk. But, um, and uh, my, my wife will take our dog out for a walk every morning. It's part of her way she takes care of herself, right? She'll get up the first thing in the morning. She'll go for about a 30 to 45 minute walk. With the dog and when i go out there i don't think twice about my safety yeah I and mean, that's part of that's part of the privilege that i have uh, of being white being male being relatively big also um i think and, and um she has told me that she thinks about every single time what would she do if what would she do if because our dog would just go up and lick the person so um you know i probably shouldn't say it publicly because you know um <laughs> But, you know, um, and that's, that's energy that she expends that I don't have to. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not just an individual thing. I know that she, it's not like she's the only woman in the world who expends that energy, right? Yeah. And, so, and so also I know that as a white person, there's things that I don't expend energy on that my friends and colleagues and just people I don't even know, people of color have to expend on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I was having a, um, a chat with some black um, uh, diversity and inclusion trainers um, yesterday, and they were talking about their experiences um, working um, in mainly white organisations and how it feels to both do the training and also a perspective or what they were they were hearing about the subjective of the clients of the people who were receiving the training and and how they were questioning um the i guess the validity of the of the training and why it was necessary and there were some com there were some comments around i don't see color um it's not a problem here that sort of thing which is quite difficult sort of like to um, navigate from um, as a as black women um, and um, I, I, I've had similar experiences there but you know what it, the, the, the liquid now talking to from were from the states and um, so my experiences have been a slightly different and I was saying when you when you're doing that training um, as a white man you know how do people take that training differently is it do you think it's a different experience I know that you train both by yourself but and also with with co-trainers and co-facilitators you know how how is that so a great question I mean you know it's fascinating to me because I do work with uh, I regularly will have uh, colleagues that I work with 
uh, often women of color, um, sometimes men of color. Um, and when we're, and particularly if we're focusing around race. And I think that, um, yeah, it's interesting to hear the way, to see the way that um, folks will relate to me versus how they might relate to one of my colleagues. Sometimes, honestly, there's times that I feel like I get dismissed. Um, but more often, I feel like it's the experience of my uh, by, by BIPOC colleagues um, and also uh, the client's colleagues and coworkers um, that, get, that get dismissed. You know, it's like people want numbers. Tell us about the numbers. Why is this yeah. important? Yeah. Rather than, can you listen to the people who are in your organization yeah. telling you this is yeah. what's happening? You know, yeah. like, why would you question? I don't understand why somebody thinks it's okay to question somebody else's experience. Well, that's not what really what's happening. You know, I mean, that's about, so that's about power. And that's about someone who's trying to impose their worldview on somebody else, rather than understanding that we all have our own worldviews. Yes. And so my worldview is valid. I mean, I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying they're all equivalent. I'm saying, but mine is valid. That person's is valid, yours is valid, you know, so forth, right? Yeah. So that's that's one piece I think that it's it, is how do we really engage with each other and, and and listen to each other and believe each other and have dialogue about it. This piece about not seeing color, um, I understand what when when white folks say that, what they're trying to say, what they're trying to say is I'm really working hard to be a good human being and to be a good ally and so forth and treat everybody the same, which is garbage. You can't treat everybody the same. Anybody, anybody who has kids, has multiple children, know that you cannot treat everybody the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, as you know. Right? Yes, I do. <laughs> right, so, yes, I do. Um, and, and also, when you say, I don't see color, it means you're also saying to the person, I don't see all of you. Yeah. I'm not wanting to see all of you. I'm not willing to see all of you. I'm not willing to understand that the color of your skin has an impact on your experience in this organization, in, in this community, in this world. Yeah. Right? Depending on where you are, it's going to have a different impact on you. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I find it, I find it fascinating in, um, as a, how do you, change cultures how do you change people's perspectives and I think it's the challenges around enabling people to see other people's experiences to to and as you said about yeah everyone's got their own their own view which is all valid but other people to to, to see that and not to be so I suppose egocentric about the view in the world because it's what I hear when people say I don't see color I don't see color so that's okay then you know so yeah but and that and that's what's wrong with that statement and to how to sort of say how to draw that out and say you know how do you feel that saying that feels to a person of color or to a person of any difference around what because it's negating the experience isn't it even though that might not be the intention that might be the impact um, and then to have a conversation about that and um, when I was having a conversation yesterday I was thinking about teaching styles what you're trying to achieve and what's the best way to achieve it um, and although you know those responses can be quite hurtful I suppose once on a personal basis um, for the trainer it's around how what what are you there to do you know <laughs> and, you know what you know what's the purpose of, of the training and how can you you know sort of make that useful um and also manage your own health and well-being as well because it, it does have an impact on both both on the trainer but I guess the people receiving the training to say that have their reasons for doing that too but just which, which just gets very complicated and I, and I don't have an answer for that <laughs> what do you think Paul? Well you know there's so much that you just said there um I, you know I, I think that one of the pieces that's important that's really interesting to think about when you talk about that very last piece about the health that it has on those of us who are facilitating the process. And um, as a white person, I don't, I, I don't, I'm just speaking for myself. Yes. And, and what, and I, what I've seen with, with my colleagues is that um, of color is that uh, they, 
it has a different impact on them. Yeah. Right. So I was working with an organization um, and uh, my, and we were online and uh, my colleague is a, was a, it's an African-American woman. And we were working with this organization fairly high level at this point in the organization. And so there's 23 participants um, in this group and um, all white, uh, 21 white men and two white women. Just, to, I mean, that's not an unusual thing, right? It was a, it was a two day, it's not, you, did, you know? And, um, and uh, it was a two day session. The beginning of the second day, we got into some stuff and this, um, one of the highest ranking white men in the group said some things that were pretty intense. Yeah. And I don't need to get into what it was exactly because I, you know, just to try to respect that company's uh, whatever. And, um, and I could see the look on her face and, we, and it was like this, you know, we're online and I could see the look on her face and I knew that it was up to me to say something about it. And it had an impact on me because it was kind of like the impact on me was, are you out of your mind? Um, the impact on her, you know, and we talked about this later, the impact on her was more like, you know, it was almost like a personal attack, yeah. even though it wasn't, it wasn't personal and it was at the same time, right? Yes, um, it, not, it felt personal in, and yeah, it might right. not have been personal, but it felt personal. Right, and I could also see the, the look on her face was, I'm not going there. Yeah. You know, and so if I, so if I don't step in, at that point to say something about it, then it just sits there. And, and, and then for her, and I'm, I'm not, no, this, I don't know this for a fact because I'm not her, but for her, not only did she get the uh, experience of hearing that person's statements, but she also then saw her co-facilitator not saying anything, yeah. right? And so does that mean that I'm, I, I don't get it? Does that mean I, agree with him does that i mean that you know um and then what's her level of trust going on in, uh, with me and i'm not perfect i'm not saying i get it all the time you know i mean i think that's part of um part of also being in those places of privileges we miss a lot at times right and, and so that's part of the way it works but you know just using that as one example of you know how the impact and talk about health and, and how the impact of that is very disparate. And we know that there's disparate health outcomes for different communities, right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And that, I guess, so that, and that brings me on to, um, so you're an ally for your, your colleague in that particular um, uh, situation. And, you know, we were talking about how white men can be allies for social justice. And um, I think, sometimes people don't know what an ally is and I think you've described it quite well in the in the example that you gave and is that you you can realize the impact of something that's been done or said and can be an advocate for speaking up about it which also validates the experience of somebody who's been impacted by it and that that might not work as a sentence but that's I guess that I haven't got um, a definition maybe I should have had it for the for the podcast but I was thinking that you can be in a, in a position where it's safe to to actually reflect back around people people the difference and and the different treatment and the different what's been said and what's been done and um, and to support and validate um that that lived experience what do you think Tom? I think, um, well, for a definition, I would say that I think uh, an ally in the, in the context of how we're naming it, I think is somebody who comes from a, a, a privileged identity who is um, being supportive of somebody or some bodies who are not, who yeah. come from a, a more right. marginalized identity, right? That said, I also think that it's, for me, it's important to remember that um, Ally is not a noun. Yeah. Uh, it's actually a verb. Uh, yeah, I like that. And so I actually often talk about allyship, yeah. right? Because, and, and so it's about engaging in behavior. And so, you know, it may not be that it, it, it may not be that I 
have to be the one who steps in and yeah. steps forward. It might be that I'm there to stand right behind my colleague or whoever it might be, you know, um, and, and support them. They don't necessarily, so people don't always need me to be the one who steps in, right? They can take care of themselves, but they might want um, some support in that. So it really depends, but it's really about behavior, um, I, I think, and how we do that. And so in the way that, because if we're, you know, I make an analogy to, um, you're familiar with uh, Ibram Kendi's work? No, uh, I'm, I'm happy to wrote a book called, um, it's a pretty big book in the States anyhow, about uh, uh, how to be an anti-racist. Okay, cool. And I may be um, misunderstanding or misquoting uh, or whatever uh, I'm doing here. So if I do, I apologize, Dr. Candy. But um, it's my understanding that when he talks about being anti-racist, he's talking about, it's not like, it, it, again, it is not about an identity. It is about behavior. And as a, as a white person trying to do this work, there's going to be times I mess up. Like I'm not going to be perfect at it. I mean, now anybody's going to be perfect at it, but I'm talking about myself here, right? I'm not going to be perfect at it. I am going to do things that are anti-racist, that are challenging um, uh, racist systems, white supremacy, so forth. And there's going to be times that I collude with it um, without my knowledge, hopefully, um, because if I'm doing that, then it's really problematic. But um, if I'm doing it with my knowledge, but uh, I, I think it's important to keep that in mind. The same thing is true about being an ally for any in any social justice arena. Yeah. That as I'm going to, there's going to be times where I'm going to nail it. I'm going to be so good at it. Yeah. People are going to stand up and cheer. No, nobody's going to do that. I hope. But um, <laughs> but there's going to be times where I'm going to miss the I'm going to miss the mark. I'm going to not say it right. I'm going to um, not even notice, right? I mean, that's part of this work is, is continuing to deepen our understanding so that we, the more we notice, the more we can have those conversations, right? And it plays out in some really significant ways and some really um, subtle ways and I, 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 or smaller ways. I, and I, one of those examples of a smaller way for me is I know even with friends, I'll be having a conversation. I, you know, I talk about race yeah. and I'll be talking with my white with white friends about race, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah," mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then change the subject yeah. after thirty seconds, and I'll just be like, "You know what? I wasn't done with that conversation." Right? <laughs> so, so, and, and I think it's actually okay. I think, I mean, at least the people who are my friends, you know, yeah. get that. Okay, oh, we're actually we're going to have this conversation, or I want to continue to have this conversation. He's not going to shame me. You know, um, but it's about how do we continue to say it's okay to talk about this, right? That's 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 a form of allyship. I'm not saying it's a huge form of allyship, but uh, but it's one form of it in a sense because we have to keep talking about it and we have to keep acting on it. It's not just about talk. Brilliant, I love that. And why do you think white men in particular have a critical role in sort of allyship for for social justice? Well. I can't speak for the entire world, um, okay. but I, do. <laughs> I think in the context of, of places where whiteness and maleness, uh, therefore the systems of white supremacy and patriarchy take precedence, um, and patriarchy is every, everywhere really, um, I, I think that we, I think that as a white man, I have access to, to people that uh, a lot of my colleagues don't and what and when i say access i mean even that i get seen as oh you're like me and so i'm gonna i may listen to you right um i think it's important that we speak up so that we're also giving you know there's this whole uh i think that there are folks in privileged groups of any group but we're talking about white men right now so we're, i think there's plenty of white men who actually do believe and want to support social justice. Uh, and I think that oftentimes um, we have felt like it's not our place to say something. And there's been times where we've been told that. Um, okay. okay. Uh, no, I mean, I think that was a, a, a very 1990s approach, okay. uh, at least in the States. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, and maybe at the end, I think it's important for us to listen also. Yeah that's part of being an ally and being an allyship. Um, so that's one piece, but I think more importantly, I think that we um, are in so many 
places of, of privilege and power that it's important for us to speak up. And um, we want to, but we don't necessarily know how. So yeah. when we see other white men speaking up, um, that's giving us some examples of how someone who is like me might be doing that. Um, and part of that is not just about speaking up, it's also about listening, right? Yeah. Uh, so I see, you know, I see another white man really listening with respect and intent, um, uh, you know, to a colleague of color, to uh, a gay colleague of color, to, you know, you know I keep going, right? Um, and, and, and being able to model that is important. You know, and also to model, even though it might not sound like I have it right now, to model humility, um, you know, around this and to model that I'm going to mess up um, at times. And I'm going to, so I also have to learn how to clean that up as best I can by cleaning it up, meaning like apologizing, apologizing with uh, not like, I'm sorry you felt that way, but I'm sorry about my behavior. Um, yeah. you, you know, yeah. and, um, and just owning that. And I think that's part of why it's important too, because, and as I said, we, you know, and look at the numbers of CEOs, look at the numbers of presidents of organizations and so forth. And look at the, you know, that when I say the numbers, look at the demographics, right? Yeah. I mean, if it, it's mostly white men. And if you look at lots of organizations and you look at the layers of those, you see that that is, that's who's still in leadership. And so if we wanna create change and we wanna create inclusion um, and justice, then we have to be part of that process. Otherwise power won't change. Um, I think that's so true. And I really love the way um, that you explained it about listening and advocating and, and being humble as well. I, I really, really like that. Um, and, but I want to say, what are the benefits of doing it? You know, what's to be gained? And that's not because people do things because they want they want kudos or they want you know they want glory around that. But there there are advantages, aren't there? What would you say? And there's and there's things. And so if you were talking to an organisation, or if I was talking to an organisation, I would sort of like talk about the business benefits, the personal benefits, you know, the financial benefits and, you know, and the moral benefits as well. And what do you see um, that what white men have to gain by working um, as allies for social justice? Great question. Um, <laughs> I think that, uh, I think there's a number of things that we have to gain. I think on a very personal level, um, we, we gain um, how do I want to put this? Uh, we gain an ability to be more human. Okay, so I mean, and that's, I know that sounds very glossy and for a business, from a business perspective, you're like, whatever. Um, <laughs> but, but so I'm talking about on a personal level, we gain that, right? To be able to, uh, to hold on to privilege. One of the things that we have to do is we have to, um, uh, be separate from other people. We have to uh, keep a distance, you know, and we have to also separate from our ourselves as well, um, from our bodies, from our emotions, uh, from our own thought process. Because because if we don't, we have to do that in order to maintain that level, right? Because otherwise, we see the inhumanity of what's going on. Right? When we start to see that, then we also um, are able to have be, be better touch with ourselves. We're able to have a better understanding of ourselves. We're going to have better health outcomes. Um, and I, and I'm again, I'm in the states, so I'm going to use U.S. numbers, but I don't know what it's so I don't know what it's like in Britain. Um, you call it Britain or England, or I, mean, I don't want to insult anybody here. <laughs> You're not. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> trust me. All right. Um, and uh, you know, so white men have the highest rates of addiction and suicide and uh, other health issues. Men in general um, have the much worse, much worse health outcomes uh, for all of like the major uh, causes of death. You know, like the top 15, we have, you know, worse outcomes on all of those things. And so part of that is, are we, 
is part of that about how we live, about how we numb ourselves, about how in order to be able to maintain this, this life, right? So I mean, that's part of it, right? That's on a personal level. So, and then when you talk about it on an organizational level, um, for us to be social justice advocates means our organizations are gonna be that much more efficient, effective, productive, um, places of joy to, to work in, you know? I mean, for so many years, white men have only had to compete against other white men, yeah. right? And so that's, so now you hear all this pushback around, well, gosh, this person got, is getting the jobs, like be excellent and you'll get the job, you know, yeah. but you, but you <laughs> were able to be mediocre and still really move up for so yeah. many years, right? Perfect. I don't know if I answered your question there, Dawn. You did answer my question. You, yeah, you talked about from a sort of like from a personal level and the benefits that will happen that will happen for you personally in your own health and well-being. And you also talked about it as an organizational level, that uh, the benefits of like it being a good place to work. And people will say it's a good place to work. They'll say and they'll they'll feed that back. And I think, you know, to reflect the culture of an organization, that's why people stay, they'll be, you know, um, people quantify that work sort of like less absenteeism you know more people recommending that's a good place to say and retaining employees as well so I think yeah you definitely did answer the question and this and the and the numbers around health and addiction and sort of like the causes of death are the same you know across across sort of the developed world really it's sort of um it's sort of like a north hemisphere um disease um, yes. really around that and I think humanizing it and sort of like you know working towards a better world if for want of a better expression is um is something that we all should be you know, striving for and it and is a, a sort of benefit so um let me just add to what and maybe I said this already and you said it really well too but you know the idea of I mean, there's, so for the folks who need those quantitative things, yeah. right, there are plenty of studies out there about organizations that are more diverse and more inclusive, also being more profitable, yeah. right? Right. I mean, that, uh, and, and attracting uh, a more, uh, a broader talent range, right? Um, because talent exists in all communities yeah. equally, um, you know, and so, so the fact that you're creating that those organizations, like you said, like people want to work there, they want to stay there and so forth. Um, and word gets out, hey, this is a good place for people to work. And um, the, the up and coming generation, this is an important piece for them, yeah. right? And so if we want to re really continue to be um, relevant, and we want to continue to be productive and, and profitable, if that's the kind of organization we're talking about, then we have to do this. We have to. So in the, in the work that you do, you know, you work with organizations, you work with, um, you work with men, um, you work with people from a range of a range of areas and it, it sounds it's it sounds quite emotive work. It sounds it sounds hard. It sounds hard work and um, how do you manage to stay focused and positive and and productive and sort of like you know keep going because sometimes when you're talking about these sort of concepts and how things should be as opposed to how they are it can it can get a bit demoralizing going back to the conversation I had with my you know my friends is that sometimes you think oh no you know so how do you keep yourself going and you know focused um, well, you know, it can be hard work, um, but it can also be really joyous work. And I, I often see that my role in the world is actually bringing joy to people. Okay. I mean, I know that not everybody goes over oh, here. comes the guy from the joy, you know, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, yes. but, I, but I think that's important, right? I think it's important to remember that, uh, that social justice is about, um, is really about spreading, partly about spreading joy, right? Because if we can have justice, then people, will, more people will be able to embrace joy in a different way, right? Um, and that might sound glossy, but I actually think that's what, what it, it's true, uh, you know? And, and that doesn't mean it's, it's not also about all those other things we talked about, um, but I think that's a part of it. So I think part of it's about a mindset, you know? And it doesn't mean that's, I don't, this doesn't mean that I'm not like halfway through a four day session one sometimes going, 
oh my god this is so hard and that person is such a jerk and blah 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 and and then i have to pull back and say well wait a minute are they a jerk it's like your lights just changed my lights just went out and i'm not i'm not going to do anything about it because you're in the middle of a podcast (laughs) Um, and, and uh you know, and then I have to like also, okay, why is that person, why do I think that person's being a jerk? And how am I going to continue to connect with that person? Right? Because I think that's a part of it is, is this is also about connection. Um, and, and the question, I think your question, if I remember, because I'm just blabbing away here, is about also about self care. Yeah. How do you care for yourself, though, Tom? Well, I think that, you know, part of it is, um, like I said, having whatever the perspective is, having colleagues that I really love to work with. Yeah. But also um, making sure I get outside and get fresh air. I mean, for me, that's actually an article. Was it was in the Washington Post or New York Times this past week about um, a, uh, something in the Netherlands where they talk about being out in the wind. Yeah, uh, I love that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah and, and absolutely. I love it too. Like I, I'm outside. I mean, it was... The other day it was, I think, 10 degrees Fahrenheit here, which is, I don't know what that is, Celsius, because in the US we don't think, believe in things that are yeah. visible by. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. it's too easy to figure that out, right? Yeah. But, uh, uh, but that's well below zero. I know that. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I could do the math. I remember there's some formula I learned in high school, but um, it. it's <laughs> minus 32 plus uh, five ninths or something. I can't remember. Anyhow, so. Um, and it was great. I mean, you dress, I dress warmly enough and I go out there and I, you know, and I just walk, take a nice hike in the woods with my dog, not worried about anything coming along. You know, I mean, I worry that maybe I might, you know, fall and hurt myself and not be able to, and freeze to death. That's a different kind of fear. Yeah. You know? Um, but, um, you know, so things like that, trying to get, you know, trying to move my body, trying to stretch, trying to exercise, um, uh, in the summertime, I like to garden, yeah, you know, that sounds good. Uh, it yeah, sounds I mean, like, good. You know, like finding things that, that again, bring you joy or happiness or uh, that you can engage both in the, the body and the, and the mind as well, you know, um, are critical. Uh, um, I think one of the things that's been challenging for uh, a lot of us over the last couple of years is um, connecting with other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. And you know, I, I mean, I have one of my best friends lives in the area and we try to go for a walk in the woods uh, once or twice a month, you know. And it was interesting when, when the pandemic first was going on, we were like walking in the woods and having to stay six feet apart from each other, and, you know, um, that kind of thing. And, you know, now that we've both been vaccinated and boosted and it doesn't mean we don't have any concerns, but we also feel like we're outside and it's a little bit, probably a little bit easier. So I think that's part of it. I mean, I think that's that's part of just trying to find the place, trying to find that balance also um, of uh, of living life um, in ways that 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 bring that just bring rejuvenation. Yeah, definitely. And you live in a nice place, and and you know you make the most of your environment. You go out for a, you go out for a walk, and you know, and that and that's part of it. I think that is part of the you know how you know I'm I was um I was on a live stream before we started recording this podcast, and we talked about similar things and the impact of the you know the global pandemic, how that then the, it's increased the need for connection. It's increased the need. Um, to be aware of you know how long you spend sitting down how long you spend in front of a screen what, how much sleep you get that sort of thing and that's I think and one of the reasons I asked the question is I guess that when people do hard jobs or if they're as their own businesses it's quite easy to forget um, how important it is to look after your own health and well-being as, as, as well as trying to be a good person and and trying to have a you know having a career or a business and and that's why I asked the question so I really like your your answers because it's about connecting with yourself connecting with nature you know and connecting with people so so I love that Tom. I think in in our in uh in our culture in in the U.S. in particular about because I don't know so much about where you are but um we often measure our selves um, through productivity yeah right? and that and that's even included in terms of like our leisure yeah right? 
what did I get done in my time off? I don't know. I stared at the wall. Maybe that was okay. Maybe that's what I needed to do, you know? Um, or, you know, I, I mean, it's not like, I don't want to have to check off. And unfortunately, I understand that. I mean, it's also like, it's my time off and I have to get the laundry done. I got to go food shopping and I got to do this and that and that. I mean, I understand all those things, right? Um, you know, th that's part of it. But that's part of self-care. Um, but also, if I didn't do those things, can I still feel okay about myself? Yeah. I still Because maybe I just needed to collapse on the couch and, and you know, watch Netflix for a while. Uh, um, I really like that because... Um, and again, it was something I said just now in, in the live stream that, you know, decide what you put, what you want and what you're OK with and you know, what's good for you. And and, you know, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be good enough and to be content with it. Because I sometimes think happiness and well-being is about being content with the, that you've done enough that you that then that's okay and it doesn't have to be oh I did a five mile run it has to be it's like I did do some exercise I did get outside I you know I did what I could do and I planned for it and I did what what I could and I think that's really important that people give themselves the grace and um, because most people I meet are working really really hard to do the best they can and um so give yourself grace for for, for doing that so thank you for that Tom that's really really good um how if people want to contact with you get in touch with you learn more about the work that you do how can people do that well um, they could find me on linkedin uh, they could it's tom schiff s-c-h-i-f-f -F. Mm -hmm. they could uh, reach me through my website tom schiff consulting.com all one word um uh, and also what we we didn't talk about at all, and I'll just put a quick plug in, is um, I also uh, am in the director of a very small nonprofit called Fallacies. And that's um, P-H-A-L-L-A-C-I-E-S dot org. Um, and we are actually, um, and it's a, a men's health dialogue and theater program. Um, and we are have moved online. So we can have people from all over the world join us male identified folks who want to join into something like that would be love to have you join us. It'd be very, very cool. Tell Currently, that, uh, Tom. tell me more about that. We well, fallacies fallacies yeah. is, is a, um, is really a labor of love. It's something uh -huh. that I, I created when I was working at the university and then brought it with me. Uh -huh. um, it is uh, what we do is we meet on a weekly basis. And so we have, it's mostly younger men. I would love to have some older men join us as well. Um, but because we started at the university, that was kind of the culture that that was there, right? Um, so, our, our in the last since we went online, our our age range has both increased and decreased. So we have some high school students as well as people who are in their twenties um, as part of the group, and we meet on a weekly basis for a couple hours, um, and in that time, we do dialogue. And we do a dialogue related to um, masculinity, um, intersecting identities, race, class, sexuality, uh, so forth. Um, we, uh, not all of this all at the same time, how that intersects with health. So we may be having a very specific, like we, we have had uh, conversations about, as I said, race <clears throat> and uh, sexuality and class and so forth. But we've also had conversations about body image and about pornography and about um, alcohol use or substance use, um, so on and so on. Uh, we talk about relationships and violence and violence prevention. So there may be, so in a given week, we will have a topic that we're talking about and kind of try to dive into that. And sometimes the topics may last more than one week. Um, and then out of that, we um, historically, what we've done is we've written performance pieces, performance pieces that are anywhere from three to uh, seven minutes. Some of those are recorded on our website. And uh, we are currently, because we are now online, um, thinking more about it in terms of, oh, and I should say, and we would perform live. So we would run, you know, take those three to seven minute ones and take and run enough of them together that we'd have like an hour long show, perhaps, or 20 minutes, depending on where we were performing. Right. Um, well, because, you know, we might be in a school and we'd be doing a school assembly or we might be going to a college and doing a larger thing or a conference or, you know, so depending on what the time frame is. Um, and, and that was always a lot of fun. And. 
I want yeah. to, I want to climb, but I'm not a man. <laughs> we might make you. We, we might, you know, we're trying to think about whether that's still relevant for us to be doing. Yeah. That, you know, but um, but now what we're trying to do is is do some of the same pieces, not the same pieces, but some different same style, um, and maybe some of the same pieces, and turn them into, um, you know, recorded pieces that are made specifically to, for an online environment. So yeah. creating resources. Yeah. So that why again why it would be great to have more folks involved in the process you know we've got a couple we haven't really put them online yet we're still trying to figure out how we're doing this yet you know and obviously yeah. um, we're going to need to make shorter pieces than three to seven minutes because you know online that's that's an eternity so. yeah <laughs> i thought so you could put things on youtube and things like that as well yeah. sort of like yeah. you know for um it just um it just widens the audience because we are in this global world now aren't we where we can touch you know that we're, we're friends we've never met and you know that and you so you can reach so many people i really like um how you've um described um yeah you know your non your non-profit it's called fallacies isn't it and you know a link to that and everything um and tom's website and his linkedin account will be in the in the show notes so Tom, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, you know, reflections, and you've made me think a lot. Um, and um, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic to have you here. Um, we usually end the show with sort of like asking our guests to give sort of one final tip nugget that they want to share that so that our listeners or our viewers can take away with them. Is there anything that you would like to say? I didn't know that was something I was supposed to think about. Um, <laughs> Um, I think this is, may sound a little glossy, but I think it's really important that we try to engage with each other from a place of love as much as possible. And, um, and well, I'm not love everything that somebody does, but if I can embrace that and that their humanity, I think that that's really a critical piece for us to think about. How do we do that? And how do we then translate that into our systems as well? I really like that. I really like that because it's not only thinking about it, and although that's really important and it's really important to process it, it's like, what are you going to do with it? What's going to be different? Um, when you when you when you have sort of processed that and you know what difference it's going to make in the world i love that thank you so much tom it's been an absolute pleasure and um, that's it for the dawn jarvis show today thank you so much for um listening or viewing if you like what you've heard, heard please do comment um, and share and subscribe to the channel that'd be really great and we'll see you soon thank you so much Bye bye